All right. I'm going to put in some notes in the chat. So, and I will make sure they're more elaborate later on. There we go. And then there is a, the terms are almost done. Um, I, I ran into a few issues late last night, trying to furiously get the first draft of the terms done. About 94% are done. There's a few that I'll mention today. That actually, today's a good opportunity to, to figure some of that out. Um, but the spreadsheet, I just linked that. That's the current status, the current draft of terms. Um, as we go down, you'll see all the terms that are there, we've done so far. There's nothing really super pending. It's just a matter of finishing up some last few details. And then I'll finish up. Right. All right. Fantastic. All right. So um, I'm going to start with the sort of the bigger picture, what the plans are, how this is evolving with the mineralogy extension, and then where this goes after we're done with the mineralogy extension for the geology extension, and then the status of the integration of EFG. Um, I've done a lot of work with that. And then onward from there, the status of GBIF and integration with GeoCase and so forth. Um, first, so the mineralogy extension task group, when it was created, it was the idea is that paleo, there already are a few geology terms in Darwin Core, mostly associated with the paleontology community. Geology as a topic is very big. Um, and so I felt it was better to attack a section of geology that has no real overlap to the existing Darwin Core standard, and that would be mineralogy. Um, and then from there, once mineralogy is done, then go up to geology extension. So they get integrated into one bigger extension. Part of the mineralogy extension and geology, which is a big departure from past practices within Darwin Core, is a compound specimen model, meaning that if I have a bird in a box, it's one bird. It's an, a Cipro cooperi, a Cooper's hawk. And that's all it really is. With geology, it's you have one object that has multiple things. And it could have rocks and minerals and however you want to define it, which is a substantial departure from biology. And so I know that that's going to be a hurdle of the document really clearly what that means because it does change a lot of the underlying models. Um, and in fact, in the mineralogy extension, which we'll see in a minute, it has a scope where certain properties apply to the mineral and certain properties apply to the specimen. And so you gotta think about it, an object with two or three minerals. And so you might have certain things that are just particular to that mineral. And then things like mass, you're not gonna actually, if you have quartz and pyrite in one object, you're just gonna take the mass of the object, not the quartz and the pyrite separately because they're all together in one thing. So that's a very important distinction, and, and we'll get there in just a minute. So that's the goal. Once this is done, I think by mid-year, um, there's a whole tadway process for ratification and expert and public review and things. I imagine that it'll be done with by mid-year or late 2023, and then from there, goes directly into the geology extension. In the charter for the mineralogy extension, one of the tasks is to map it to EFG. EFG, um, I, I've begun processing it on a very detailed level. And I I've written a couple things on it. I need to revise it. But the problem is, if you're familiar, that EFG is an XML-based standard, and Darwin Core is JSON-based. And that is very technical and verbose. But it presents substantial challenges when you're mapping one to the other. And a lot of it has to do with the hierarchies, how data types are defined, how, how nested things are nested between things, how terms are even used. And so I'm, I'm working through it. I should be able to, but it is on the on the list of tasks, required tasks by the charter. So it can't get ratified until it maps to EFG. So I've, I've begun that process of doing that. And a lot of terms do map to it. Um, some of them won't want to figure that out, but it, it's it's there. So the idea is that you know EFG does have a maintenance group, but this will hopefully be the bridge where Darwin Core and EFG can meet. And then you could have things in knowledge extension that get mapped to EFG, which then go to GeoCase. And within there is a common geology collection model that I've developed as part of a different project for specified software platform that integrates all of geology collections into one large model. And the mineralogy extension is just a part of that for data publishing. Um, and so it all builds from there. And the EFG mapping should be done by mid-year. 
I, I've worked through it and I imagine I'll start publishing some things. The other activity that's going on that I'm almost ready to push some things out are a registry of controlled vocabularies. The first ones are Hayes, Dana, and Nickel Strunz. I have all three of them digitized. I need to finalize the metadata that's stored with those vocabularies, with those values. Part of it is trying to create metadata for hierarchical structures, really interesting. Um, there is a, a collection platform that uses Hayes, Arctos. And so I had to throw in Hayes um, at the last moment. Uh, but it'll be six or seven classification schemas for geology will be put up in a GitHub repository. Then there'll also be um, a couple of basic mineralogy ones like Habit or Crystal Form and things like that, where it'll be a CSV file and it'll be published and it'll be public and people can just integrate that directly into their own system and use it as they want to. It's, a, it's one thing that for the past year that I've gotten most frequently requested and as a need in the community is having just Dana digitized and having it in a format that can be readily read by anyone in a CSV, open up in a spreadsheet, put into a database, um, things of that nature. So I wanted to make sure that's gonna be there um, as part of this project. I think they're really, really important. And I just happened because of the other project, I've collected just this massive amounts of existing vocabularies from all over the place. And so I wanna make sure I put those to use and actually put them out there for people to use. So that'll happen within the next two or three months. I, we're, we're trying to figure out if it's going to be a Tadwig repository, an official one, because Tadwig does have a process for publishing control vocabularies. It's very detailed and it's well beyond anything that would current purposes. Um, and so I need to figure out if there's a different mechanism, but we will. Okay. Turn off the if you have any questions, please speak up by all means. Um, so I will post, I'm gonna post those two links one more time. So we have the meeting notes and then the current draft, let's see. There are the notes if you'll fill in your institution and I'll make sure those are filled out later. And then there's the current draft of the terms. Um, I almost got through them all, Rachel. There, there's a couple we need to talk about. Um, and so that's the status there. Um, we have an expert reviewer already for uh, once, so once this is, we're, we're done with our terms list and we have all our CSV files and everything, it goes to an expert review, which is you have a review manager. And I just did this for Latimer Core. And that person selects two to three expert reviewers. And then there's a, a 60 to 90 day review of the standard. Once it gets past that, and then there'll be some suggested changes and things. Then it goes to public review, which is a minimum of 30 days where anybody can comment, goes into GitHub, and then you have the community comment. Then there's some changes there. And then once it gets past that, it goes to ratification. And fortunately, I just did this for Latimer Core. We're almost done. And one of the conveners of Latimer Core is going to be the review manager for mineralogy extension. We kind of, we traded. <laughs> Said, if I, I'll be the review manager for Latimer Core if you'll be the review manager for mineralogy extension. And so she, she's at the Field Museum. She's really great. Um, so that's good. So we already have that those things in place because the person that's a review manager is not allowed, if the person had worked on a standard at all, in, in any role, at any capacity, even attended two meetings, they can't be an expert reviewer. And so that can cause issues down the line sometimes, trying to find people, but we worked this out from the beginning. So if you'll go ahead and open that spreadsheet, um, the one that's got the 2024 working session next terms. I'll, I'll probably share my screen here in just a second. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep. All right. So classes, if you're not familiar, classes are just groups of terms. So standards, and I'll, I'll show you what Darwin Core looks like. It's right here. Uh, Darwin Core is divided into classes, record level, identification, organism, location. They're, they're thematic. So all the terms in Darwin Core related to a geographic location is in the location class. Um, things evolve with taxonomy, genus, species, kingdom, phylum. Those are all in the taxon class and on from there. Um, these are the 10 classes in Darwin Core, and that's how they're grouped. And then there are three terms. Now, I'll put this in the Google Drive directory. It just has a couple example terms of what go in there. So the mineralogy extension is also organized in the same manner. We have 
a couple classes, physical properties, which are defined, geologic settings, which are the place of formation, and currently, well, I'll get there in a minute, and then hazard, so things that are you know, hazardous. Um, this was chemical properties. I changed it to composition, and so last night, and uh, so I want to talk about that just in case. I know, I know. Yeah, hang yeah, on, I know, hang on. I know. Well, you, let, let me do this. Please don't do that way. without asking. <laughs> I know. Well, that's why we're having this today. That, that's the whole reason. So um, an absolute age for, for radiometric dating and then names. So, and then there's, there's one that doesn't really fit the theme, theme that we need to work out. So um, let's see, so physical properties, here they are. Um, and then, and maybe we'll run through these in a minute. Hazards, age, geologic environment, geologic setting. So what we had was we can't use geological context was what, the reason I changed this, because that's already a class in Darwin Core at the specimen level. And so we can't reuse a class name for um, mineralogy extension. So it's a dip because mode of occurrence, parenthetic mode, these are, these right here are mineral level. And so we can't extend a class that already exists in Darwin Core for this purpose. So I changed the geologic setting. I'm not stuck on that, but I realized that in our documentation that I had to be changed. Now, there are, so in Darwin Core, there is the geologic context class. These are the terms in it. It's just the geologic timescale terms, lowest highest probably, aerotherm system. It has biostratigraphy, which doesn't apply here. Um, lithostratigraphic terms, and then it has lithostratigraphic ranks of group formation member bed. These are great for paleontology. <laughs> they don't, but they sort of, the, they limit there. So there are, we're going to propose three additional terms to this, which are complex, sweet, and super sweet or metamorphic, which are located, this is where things might get a little confusing, um, down here. So these are in the geologic context class of the existing Darwin core standard. So, but then we have these additional ones, mode of occurrence, parenthetic mode, feature of inches, sample feature that are additional um, terms of the mineralogy extension. Does that make sense? Am I, did I lose anybody? That explanation? Um, and then, so if you go down now, this, there are specimen level terms. It should be here. It's not objects, it's specimens. So we have things like maximum axial dimension, which is the, the greatest axis in the specimen. The object has that attribute, and so does the mineral. So if you have a big quartz crystal stuck in something, the object itself has the maximum axial dimension, but then so does that longest quartz crystal. And so that's why we have this. There's not too many terms where we have them at both levels, but we have to list them twice because you can measure either one, right? Um, and that's just sort of the way. And there's not a lot of, there is a, a class right now that, that sort of a catch all for measurements in Darwin Core called Measurement or Fact. Um, it's, it's really just a catch all for custom vocabulary. I think we should be more, a little bit more explicit about it than just sort of use a catch all. But, um, and then from there, you've got size verbatim. Is a, is a very specific term in Darwin core speed. Verbatim is, the easiest example is that you have a, a ledger for a bird and it was collected in East Germany, the, the ledger's 15, 12 years. Well, the idea is that for verbatim country name, I would enter East Germany. That's, that's where it was, that's the verbatim, that's what it was in the original ledger on the label, the field notes, whatever, the primary source material, that's the country it was listed as. But in the country field, I'll update it to German. So that's basically how that is. So size verbatim, mass verbatim, those are how in the original primary source material, where it's a ledger, a label, whatever it may be, that's what the size is quoted as. And there's, if you go to Darwin Core, there's several ones. verbatim locality, there's verbatim collection date, these sorts of things. And that's what it means. You're capturing it. It's not unaltered. It is exactly how it's written in the original primary source material, like a historical then you also have the more the mass, which is in grams, which is the measured one, which is not verbatim. So it's two fields, but they're very important because I know there are all kinds of different weights, weight units of measurement, things like that. We want to capture that stuff, um, but that's why some of those have those damage. Obviously, just you know, if it's been dropped, um, matrix matrix description, associated minerals. I need to tidy up that a little bit, um, and then crystal habit, crystal form. One of the other discussions 
that's been going on is how do we include control vocabularies with this? And this is very important. We'd like to have, for example, a suggested, a suggested list of values for crystal habit, right? Um, that process of, of having a shared space for control vocabularies is a separate task than this. So we won't actually include them in the standard. It, it's thought of as a separate layer, um, but we definitely want to make sure we have that. But it's, it's a, we won't have it with the ratification of the standard. It'll be a separate path. Um, different process. So twinning, uh, description, color, cleavage, luster, inclusions, I think we're all on board with that. Um, and then luminescence description, we had this you know, question when we went back about fluorescence, different types of luminescence, so it just got looped into one. Here's the next one. So last night I was going through these and X solution texture for minerals makes sense. That's what it was. But there are a lot, once we branch into geology and even in mineralogy, there are other types of textures. So in a sense, in my mind, it's you don't want to list out every texture as a separate field. What you'd like to have is a texture field, and it has whatever type of texture it is with some description. And so my, my question to you guys is, is that. Um, and then this one, if you just have this texture, you can extend that to geology, right? You don't have to, it doesn't stay in that space of mineralogy. So I propose we change X solution texture to texture. And if it is X solution texture, you just you mentioned that in the description, right? But this gives a little more flexibility while maintaining control. Does that make sense? So like I might actually include X solution texture as, as the example, right? And just have a description. Uh, um, what are the textures do you think? Um, what's the um the texture in um chemosite and tainite and iron meteorites? Wollstone, what what is the no wood band stuff? Yes, that's a texture, for example. Um, you know, you have metamorphic textures, things of rock. I, mean, I think of rocks a lot about those types of textures you may have. So this field would be that you could extend this field to rocks, which is sort of rolling up to the next um iteration of this, right? So we're sort of because it that's when it really becomes a bit more complicated. So that's kind of what I'm, I don't think they're I mean, does that make sense? Like X solution texture, maybe the only one really concerned with here. But we do know that next iteration will be geology. There'll be different types of textures. You don't want to have, you know, four or five terms just for texture. You want to have one. And so this just allows you to do that. And we put X solution texture as the, as the example of the term. Can you say what the difference is again? Sorry. I think so, I don't know what X solution is. So maybe that's messing with my ability to tell the difference. It's a type of texture. It's just specific to minerals, especially. So it was that type was put as a term, but types are typically not good as terms. It's just a type of something where texture is is the actual concept, right? It just happens here that you're not really within minerals. There's not really that's the texture you're mostly focused on, and so it makes sense. But because of geology and things, we just want to open it up to to, to a general more texture field, and then allow the data provider to be more specific about the type of texture that we're. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Like I think I understand. Well, and it, it really, if you look at metamorphic texture, sedimentary textures, that's when it starts getting very broad because you can make comments about depositional environments or all kinds of different things once you get into rock textures. And so it's really just, it's not limiting us to, to just minerals with this term. This is where I don't know why you didn't use employ geological context for many of like the modes of formation that we were talking about. What do you mean? I'm not following you. Because that could have been broadened for the geological environment terms that you've got there. What do you mean? You mean you would put texture down in geologic environment? No, 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 not texture. The geological environment terms within geological context just to um, reduce the number of terms that are floating around there that sort of mean similar things. Well, it's this is more of a of a structural issue. I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm totally following you. It's just that geologic context is a class at the at the specimen level. So you can't reuse that class name at the mineral level in the extension. Yeah, it's, it's just, just a shame. I guess it was a shame that was defined only for things that really um, referred to paleontology because geological context is a much broader concept yeah. and it does include 
all the mineralogical or petrological features. So I'd hoped that we could expand it to be relevant to mineralogical specimens too, rather than have a whole new term, geological environment. If you get what I mean. I do, I absolutely do. And, and, I, and I, I agree. And, and I talked with Steve Baskoff, who's the sort of the guru of, of Tadwick, RDF and things. And we, we I, I, you know, what if we just, what if we use geologic context too? We just scoped it, it just here it's mineral and there yeah. it's specimen and it, it won't work. So you, you have to have just well, class names and because or we add have terms separation, you know, well, we are adding complex sweet and super sweet geologic context, but we can't reuse that at the mineral level. Right. So mm -hmm. we have to use something else okay. at the mineral level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but mineralogical context, but that doesn't really make sense. I don't know. I mean, I'm open to, this just happened recently, so and I just circle back to it. So, whatever the term may be, I just know we can't use. That's the point. We can't use it's not a bad term. It just makes it more uh, of a messy field, which makes it more difficult for users. It's easier sometimes if there's a fewer terms to choose from. <laughs> well, it, one of the things we're trying to figure out is that in the documentation pages, how do you make it very clear what's at the mineral level and what's at the specimen, right? Like, how do you? Yeah structure the documentation in a way though that is because that's that's new to Tadwig, right? There are that's gonna be a mm -hmm. new thing with this. And it, it's gonna be more important, even more important with the geology extension. And so we have to figure out a way to make that very clear. Um I'm still sort of baiting on to do that. But the other thing, so um hazard types, I think we would do is hazard requirements, hazard marks, hazard types are pretty straightforward. It's its own um thing. One thing I moved, so we had treatment. Um description of any process taken to mitigate damage, whatever it may be, right? Like I, I've got a blue halide, I keep it in a box without sunlight because it'll fade or halide doesn't do. Um, that's not really, I mean, it's not really a physical property because it's something, it's like a preparation. Um, it's not really, I think we had under, it's not really a hazard class either. It's sort of, it's almost like a preparation in the same way. It's something you do to a specimen once it's been collected and integrated into the collection, things like that. It, it's, a, it's a way of, of, it's like about collection management, right? Specimen management more than anything else. And it, it sits, there's not really anything else like it in, in that we've created in this term list. I'm not sure where to put it. Um, and the other question is, is this at the specimen level or mineral level? It seems at the specimen level, right? Can anybody think of an instance where this would be at the mineral level? Yeah? Well, a, a repair. <laughs> well, but, so, a broken, a broken crystal. Would you need to do that? That well, yeah, I guess you kind of. Well, could you still use it at the specimen level and just indicate that, hey, this treatment, this was fixed as part of the specimen. Like you don't need to put it at the mineral level. If that makes sense, you can have it at the specimen. Yeah. Was there an instance where you would have to have it at the mineral level? Anybody think of anyone where it would have to be at the mineral level? No. That simplifies it. There are, what it can do is in Darwin Quarrel go back, there is a, a space for preparations. And so it'll probably go into that. Maybe I need to go back and look what that is, but there is a, a space for that. Things like, you know, it's a thin section. Is it um, a powder? Um, so there are the geologic context terms we added. Geologic settings, we haven't quite hammered it out. In fact, this is actually a feature of interest. The, the interesting thing here, and I've got a diagram of some of that. Um, well, I'll go back to it now. So feature of interest, your know, specimens, geology collections are basically representations of a larger body out so it's a small chunk of something bigger. It's a, it's a compositional representation of a larger body. If it's from a certain formation, that, ex, that formation exists out there and over some spatial region. This is just a, an example of that um, body. So, but if you have a fox or a bird, there's not some bigger bird really it's part of, right? It's, it's you know, and, and not only that, but in within one formation, obviously there are different lithologies and things change and alter. And so it's important to indicate the feature of interest 
a specimen came from. And what that is, is like, when I go collect it, we know it's that formation, but what part of that formation? Is it, was it an outcrop? Was it a road cut? Was it uh, a rubble pile? It's those kind of terms that are really important here. Um, that, and then the, the, that's the feature of ventures. It, it's the feature that you went and collected the specimen from. And the sampling feature is something that's, a, and I need to, we had tried to hammer this quite out yet, but it's also a little bit of a distinctive thing. You have the outcrop, which is like just an exposure of some formation, but then you have the feature it's a sample of. So if you have a formation that has a lithology, maybe it came from the bottom, the top, it's some, um, maybe there's a phospholiferous section of that formation, but it's varied. And so maybe the sampling feature is the phospholiferous section of a formation. And I got it from a road cut that was blasted and exposed the rock in some way. That sampling feature and feature of interest is what I went after. So that's the notion there. And I think that that's be, we'll move under collecting event. Um, there are some ontologies that discuss that. It gets a little complicated because really you could start saying that something is a compositional representation of um, the mantle, like peridotite, like a peridotite, which there's, you can run away with these kinds of things sometimes. Um, but that's that side of it. The other thing, but the new one for mineralogy is, is the parent-genetic mode, mode of recurrence, these sorts of things. Where did it come from? And there's some papers, Hazen has papers. I didn't need to go back and, and sort that out. Um, there are, so there are also landforms and geologic provinces, which I haven't, I thought about that too. So we don't have anything about geologic provinces um, or tectonic areas, tectonic provinces, you know, that whole, vocabulary. It would make sense that this, that would go under geological context. You'd have a tectonic unit, maybe, or tech, which would be the same. It's, it's the same term for geologic province, tectonic unit, these sorts of things. It's not a compositional-based unit. It's a structural-based unit. It's what the sort of the general definition for these kinds of things. But would we ever need to have more than one? Could you really just say it's this and then let people define how they want to? We don't have a hierarchical system in the United States. I mean, the states do. I know in Switzerland you do. You've got four ranks for domain subdomain. Um, and so, but does it make sense? Would we need any more than one field to define the tectonic, the geologic province, tectonic province, whatever term you want to use, um, to label that? So if it was a metamorphic domain or a structural unit, you would just put them both in a um, geological context for Bacon field or how are you um, picturing this? It'd be one field. Well, there, so there's two things. So you have geologic landforms, like let's say, um, oh, you know, um, island arc or something. So it's a, it's a geomorphological you know, region, like a habitat. It's equivalent to basically habitat, right? But then you have named structural regions, which is like the basin and range of the Western United States, right? So it's a name thing. It's a, it's a type of, of morphological feature that has a name. Um, yeah, and I would- Origins are a case in point. That's perfect. So it's like a proper noun. One of them's like a, a you mm -hmm. know, a, right? One's a proper noun, one's not. Um, and so those would be in, in one or two fields under geologic context with formations. It would be, you know, geomorphological feature or um, I mean, tectonic province, some, some sort of term that explicitly defines those things. Yeah, uh, certainly it would be relevant for my collection. <laughs> the question is, what term do you use? Tectonic province or geological province? Uh, some geological terms. context, general. Quite well, it would be in that class. Start. It would be in mm. that class. So it would be terms within that class. So this one, where you have, these are the terms in the geologic context class currently. So you'd have complex, you would be adding five terms, complex, sweet, super sweet, and then tectonic province, and then, you know, geomorphological feature or something, right? Uh, would be two terms down here. We discussed this. I'm not sure we, well, we had because we were talking about right. metamorphic environment. Hmm. We could also approach this once yeah. we get the geology extension too. We don't. I think maybe that's part. You know, 
mean, we've definitely want mode of formation, right? Parenogenic mode for minerals. But we could also just wait for this once we get to geology. Is it more of a geology thing? No, not particularly. If you if you have a very good example of a metamorphic mineral and it comes from a certain environment, I'm sort of thinking, you know, sillimanite, uh, andalusite, kyanite, you know, it's quite useful sometimes. Uh, in fact, I have it in the collection. Because again, this is really to describe the information we have in our collections. Right. Um, and it is in our collections. We don't want to lose too much information that's there when we um, export data into Darwin Core. And those are not covered by mode of occurrence or parigenetic mode? No, no. Parigenetic mode is quite specific. Um, mode of occurrence, ugh, you I could I'm bend it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to do that, right? Um, and I can't remember. Go back to the, the notes a little bit, but I thought we had. The I distinction we between that. this. See, I thought so, and I'm I'm having a hard time. This is the Who's actual Tom and the, uh, the people that were at Andre. It must have got. I must. It must have gotten put here, and then not. So. The geologic settings, which is the tectonic environment, shield, extension zone, hotspot, right? Geological you event, said, yeah. right? Whoops, I must have somehow. Whoops. There we go. Tectonic deformation phase, metamorphic, volcanic, plutonic. It's great. That, and the geologic occurrence, exactly. the geologic environment that resulted formation of the mineral. Okay. Um, makes sense. So, but so if this is all, if the this would well, these would go in the. Would you ever have, I mean, I can't imagine that one object would have two geologic events, one event associated with one mineral, one event associated with another mineral. I, no. Yeah, oh, I mean, actually, I can't, I mean, that's the thing. Every rock tells a story, doesn't it? True. Um, and the story are the different events. So, yeah. But would you need that's it at the, you'd have to have it at both then, because we definitely want it at the specimen level. I'll, I'll work over time. Yes. But even minerals tell stories. They have ghosts and they have. So you would have minerals. geologic event, geologic mm -hmm. setting, geologic occurrence at both the mineral and the. solution. <laughs> right. But you would have those both at the specimen and the mineral level? Yeah. Yeah. Mineral. Yeah. Yeah. Minerals and rocks tell stories. I'll make sure this, that gets updated for the next week. Um, right. Okay. Okay. But uh, I will make sure I update that stuff. Um, and then, and then we had the ideal formula, measured formula, right? Um, pretty straightforward. Just the representation of the chemistry. And then the I did make one change to talk about. Um, in the absolute age, we had max age, max uncertainty, max uncertainty type, the type of calculation that was went into determining the uncertainty. I can't imagine a situation where you would calculate on the minimum uncertainty and the maximum uncertainty differently, right? And so I simplified it and just with one uncertainty type. I mean, unless you really, I mean, computationally, why would you use a different, like one sigma versus two sigma, two sigma for min? And it just wouldn't make a lot of sense. And so I just combine those into one the type of uncertainty calculation and then put in the notes that this assumes you use the same uncertainty type of calculation for both the minimum and the maximum. I think that's a reasonable assumption to make, unless I'm missing something. Well, um, we do meet once a month. If, if you're if you're new to this and you have not um, been joining us, please, um, Nicholas. I know I need to, I need to add you to this stuff. I know um, in the mailing list and make sure you're on board. We do. I will finish up what we talked about today. Make sure those are all ready by the next meeting. <laughs> that will be a draft. 
there are things to add, like you have to add data. If you go, actually, if you want to see all the fields that are part of a Darwin core standard, you can go to the Latimer core and right here and the terms and you have, let's go on down. So uh, the qualified term is the namespace followed by the term itself. The namespace is, is the, every vocabulary, Darwin core's namespace is DWC. Um, every data standard has a namespace. And so a term that belongs to that namespace is prefixed with it. Um, the term IRI, which is just the permanent URI, the label, there, there's a difference between term and label. Label is the human readable version. You can change that a lot too. Um, the term is the machine readable version. So one of the original terms in Darwin Core was state province. And if you change a term, it can break all kinds of things, right? But you can always change the label. And so I, I submitted last year, I submitted a proposal to change it, the label to first order geopolitical division because they're more than just state and province types, right? Um, and so that's how we have the label. It's also multi, uh, so if you, the English, the term is always English, but the label can be multiple languages. Um, the definition, the notes, general notes, uh, examples, data type, required, repeatable, and then the RDF type. SCOS, we won't worry about it right now. But so I got to, I need to add all these things, right? And go through and make sure it's fully complete. And then over the next video, we can just, I'll send it out there by like, just check and comment on it. Um, it's really, it's, this one's actually, Latimer core is very long. So this one, what it really looks like. And then we'll need to pick a color, by the way. This is the Latimer core purple. Um, it's part of it. And then if you go, there's a quick guide and there's also resources here. I don't think we're going to need this for mineralogy extension. Uh, Latimer core, we definitely did because it's so big. It just helped. Um, that's how that all shakes down. Now, uh, the larger subject. This is, I need to, I'm writing some more formal documents about the constituent part types, constituent parts. Is that you have an object as multiple parts, then have some examples. I think everybody here makes sense. I, I don't think there's any, you know, but I do know in the community, most people are biology based. So just understanding certain terms and structures and how a geologic specimen looks, it's going to be important. There are two other terms I forgot about: role and proportion. I have this rock. <laughs> this is a rock from Wyoming has gold in it. Gold, it, it, it's important mineral in here, right? But it's interstitial, right? It, it's very small. I mean, when you when you mine gold, I mean, typically a, what a gram of gold is a ton of of um, post rock, fresh, and you can move the gold from it. So the role and proportion is really important because if I look at something, is that mineral a rock forming mineral on that rock? Is it big, you know, phenocrystic and out of it? Is it, you know, sort of interstitial in the matrix? Is it whatever it may be? And so and then proportion. If it's just one quartz crystal like this one, it's it's just a big single crystal and it's 100 percent quartz. But you may have things that are 50-50, um, like stilbite and apoprophyllite from, from India. A lot of times those things are always together, fine in India. And so, and, and I've got one that's 50-50. And so, or this, you know, there's all kinds of things. So, but that's what this is. Um, and I'll put some documentation on there. I, I don't think there's any, this is probably confusing anyone here, but it, it certainly will be. It's come up a lot when I've presented this to the larger Tadwick folks, whatever, whatever meeting it may be when I'm showing this, it's always a question getting their head wrapped around it because they're just so used to thinking about the birds and fox, right? Um, this is the actual large geologic model. So these boxes are major components. They, with the general common model, it's conceptual based. And I don't really get into attributes with this. Um, this is part of the, this is more of a generalized version of the other project where the mineralogy extension sort of fits. I don't, attributes are just key value pairs in certain places, right? How you would weave. Um, but this is the larger component. One constituent part has multiple ages. It could have a relative age. It could have an absolute age. Maybe it's got something on a geologic time scale. It's got a land mammal age. It has an absolute age for radiometric dating. Um, lithology are sort of general terms or attributes of the thing. Stratigraphy, there are multiple stratigraphic types. It could have a biostratigraphy and magnetostratigraphy together. Uh, two zones, and those are often done together, right, for reporting various events. And so it's important that that's a one to many. And so, and I'll have document, but this is where this is going. I think the geology extension will be based from here outward. We've already have absolute age, for example. So we have the terms for absolute age that goes up there. Um, and so I think the geologic will sort of start building from the structure. We'll just, we'll actually get into terms because this one doesn't. Um, 
Last Sorry, Ben, is this the geological model for um, specify or is it for? It, it's um, a version. It is not specific to, so Okay. this, this model was created at a, on a conceptual and logical basis. So it doesn't get into the, um, the requirements of, an, of a, a single software application. It, it, it's not specific to any one database vendor either. It doesn't have like MySQL data types or the limitations of you know, our, our Postgres sequences or whatever it may be. It's all conceptual based. So it, it captures all information. And what, how it works is you have this one common model, then you can map you know, 10 different databases in 10 different formats to the common model that captures everything. And then you can publish from the common model. It's how it works. And the camera trap community is now doing this. It's worked out really well because there are these, there are five major platforms in camera traps and they all were a little different. And so we had to bring something together. Then you can publish from there because you don't publish everything. Um, you're not publishing your load information, for example. But that's what this is. It, it's the common conceptual model for that captures all specimens and geologic collections. And thus far, there's not a specimen that doesn't capture it. There's no information loss. There's certain requirements it has to do. Um, a couple of other bases and structure. Where, where does chemistry fit in? Well, chemistry, a property. So it, it would be probably as an offshoot of lithology. I'd probably put it over there. I mean, it would be, so ideal formula and measured formula are key value pairs. Um, it's, you know, SiO2 or, well, let's, let's say it's Mg, Mg2 SiO4 or Mg.15 Fe.85, whatever. It's just, it's just a key value pair. So that's probably a mineralogy. Lithology is really, it splits out. Like metamorphic rocks have certain terms. Um, Sedimentary rocks have certain terms. Meteorites have certain terms. They're blocks of terms. This would probably go under that as a class under lithology. Under lithology. I think it's separate to the and, lithology. Well. Because lithology can be textured. Think about it. Geo right. And geology, it's not right. only defined by chemistry. I think you're I think you're thinking about it too literally. It's just it's it's where it would belong in that sort of group term. Lithology is probably the wrong term. Um, but I yeah. would it would maybe that's the issue. Right. But it would yeah. that's what it, yeah. But I would store it under that. Because then you have things that only apply to meteorites, right? Like the weathering grade and, and the petrologic types and things like that. And so you want to have a place where you can sort of group these things together, but then scope them to whatever type of constituent part you have, or rock or whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, but it's got to all go in one, it's got to use the same structure. That's the trick. Like, how do I create a structure that'll capture ideal measured formulas? Petrologic type and you know sedimentary textures or something, right? It all has to go in the same structure and captured in the same way. And so grouping these terms and those are all grouped under lithology. I need to come up with a better term for it. But that's a real way to go because they're not age, they're not names, they're things. Last but not least, so the names array. Um, so names array is pretty simple. You have a classification, whatever it may be, a classification schema belongs to Dana and Nickel Strines. Then you have all the alternate terms. The alternate terms have types. So a variety, a historical name, a synonym, whatever it may be, those all get into, you know, into here. So alternate names could be, it's kind of like a, in Linnaean taxonomy, common names, right? Like a mountain lion's um, puma collar um, has, I think there are nine different common names for mountain lions, pumas, polar bears, all things. Those are all sort of common names. And those common names have types because historical names are important, right? To create that distinction. You have, you know, amethyst is a variety of quartz. Quartz is the classification. Amethyst is the alternate name of type variety. And that's how that's captured. And that's in a separate array that I need to put on the term sheet. That's just because of the way it's structured. Because you at least want, the requirement is you have one classification term. Um, and then you can have, but you can have more than one. You just have to designate one as primary. So you could have the Dana and the nickel strunts if you wanted to. Um, just designate one as the primary when you, so make sure we search or whatever that may be. Um, and then you can have zero to as many types of alternate names as you want. But it allows you to capture all that kind of stuff in the structure. I think that's under. So identifier, identifier type, name type, usage, preferential label, literal form. So, you know, because Dana, the codes, the other thing about mineralogy, departure from tech, Linnaean is that these things have codes. And those codes are important. And they're not the same. The encoding scheme for nickel struns is not the same as the actual classification name. They're separate. This is a, a, a really an encoding scheme by a classification scheme. And so they're, they're split. 
if it has one. And that's a new, you don't want to combine them. A lot of times you probably combine them, but they're two separate concepts. Keep them separate. Um, but that's identifiable. Let's go. There's a publication that actually talks about all different types of alternate names. So I've got those. And then I'll have digitized versions of Hayes, Nickelstruns, Dana, the Mindat Struns, and then the and then five or six rock classifications up within the next week or two. It's just locking down the, the metadata. They'll be in a GitHub repository itself. It'll be locked into a GitHub repository. Sorry for not being a little more prepared. I, I started a new job last month, and it's, I'm trying to juggle things a bit, I'm trying to catch up with this kind of thing. But it's, it's, things are smoothing out. Those concerns. Nobody else has it. We, we can end. Nobody has any questions. I think we're good. Um, so I, I'll send out a meeting if you'd like to join or if you're not a regular member of our Metallurgy Extension Task Group. Um, I'll send that meeting out very soon. And I'll, I'll make sure the notes are goal is that the next meeting I will have a full term list for every, you know, here you go. Just a, a big, basically just a spreadsheet with all these, all the columns, everything there. Then once we can, we go through that, approve it a couple iterations, we can then, um, it can go move forward, which is good. So, and I've shown some to Sharon Grant. She's seen, I she tried, knows. I tried to take notes in the Google doc, but <laughs> you might want to check because I'm not sure I got everything hundred percent. Sometimes it was a bit fast. But I did my best. <laughs> and, and I apologize. Most people here, I've probably given that 30 minute spiel several times. <laughs> I know for Tom, for sure, like I heard this thing <laughs> multiple times. Um, and I apologize a little, a little, a little fast. I've gotten it locked down, but um, after a while, sort of. But it, it's, it's good. I, a lot of people are excited about this stuff. So. <clears throat> Then the next time there will be the approvement of all the terms, if I if I understood it correctly. So yep. then, could you send us the final document maybe one or two days before? Because I absolutely want to review it first. Yes. Else I will be there without any knowledge again. <laughs> <laughs> could could we exactly? Could we perhaps meet and just? agree on all the terms so there's yes. no surprises in the middle of the meeting um <laughs> maybe as a smaller group and then yeah. get it go out to discussion because it will just be chaos if we yeah. do it before the next group if you don't mind um, so and, that sounds and then yeah and send it out i've just joined the smmp which is a mineralogical uh, museum mineralogical professional group and i would like them to send it to them for comment as well in my mind, the ideal is that I get it done well ahead of the next meeting, which should not be a problem. Send it out. Good. All the members of the extension task force approve it. Like you guys just go through it and you put your stamp on it or changes. And if they're changing to be made, we, we meet as a group and talk about. Then once that's locked in, you can distribute to colleagues, your group, whatever. Then once those things come back, then we can sort of begin the yeah. um, ratification process. Does that make sense? So we open it out after that please. So next meeting in about a month. Yes. Yeah. Um, what's the date? I can't really close. I yep, really that should close. be all right. We'll send out a, a doodle poll or something. Is there anything I mentioned that I need to explain better? 
write a document just uh, you think that or people that might be confusing for some folks that maybe could use more of an explanation why don't we send it out okay and um see what the community say back again do our best but um okay. do that but only after we've met next time and we'll try to look at it in the introduction when you launch the ratification process it might be good to to say in the introduction the your next steps and that you will put controlled vocabularies and that you will map it with efgs so people are not confused or, and that they know what comes next and so they they know that uh, because as they will say again yes but which standard should i use uh, efg or so to to reassure them a bit that we we know about this and that we try our best to to reconcile and map everything. And I'm trying to balance the the knowledge domains too. So you have the biology people. But I don't want to bore you guys with <laughs> really long stuff. You just are well aware of, but they. But it's come up over there, and so I'm really trying to sort of parse those sorts of things out to make sure I target correct audience and get things. Because I know that some of the public, I don't want to get into a public review or expert review with biology folks about entitled. We can get into details where it's a misalignment of of expertise, right? Say focused on terms, but not get sort of drowned in and on explaining geology, right? Okay. Um, you know what I mean? Provide enough yeah. information where. Yeah. No, I just right? mean in general the. Yeah. About the the standards and the mapping, not not going too much detail, but uh, the 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 main uh, approach and also what comes next uh, to this ratification. Yeah. A chart. Well, I'll let everyone know when it, the video goes up onto youtube and, and you can play it back at half the speed and, and understand what i said <laughs> <laughs> but i don't know what what you intend to do with the notes or... oh we'll just I, i'll go through them in a little bit yeah because thank you, thank maybe you i wrote some stupid things i don't know <laughs> no, it's no, no, Patricia. no 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 <laughs> you always have good comments patricia <laughs> um and yeah, um, the CTEF ESG, which is Laura yeah. and Patricia's group, are one yeah. of the groups that we would certainly want to send it out to for comment. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I want to try to make sure that after that, I get the EFG mapped. So then let's see the, the because that's that, that bridge is going to be is extremely important, right? Mm -hmm. Is how do these map to one another? So quite important. Yes. I just I had to get it out of the XSD format and get into something mm. that can be worked, and I've almost got it. We did this exercise many years ago uh, between uh, Darwin Core and ABCD for the, the life science part, and we had some issues when uh, there were different versions of ABCD published. Uh, they couldn't follow. So the mapping was working with Darwin Core and the previous version, but the new version wasn't working anymore. So uh, it's when you do the mapping, uh, it's not like it's an never ending story, but uh, at each new version, you have to cross check that the mapping is still valid. Yes. Well, yeah. and, and uh, even though there's AFG three, I think the uh, two is. Um, the only one that people use. Yeah, I haven't. I can't find. I've only seen two. I haven't seen three. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think three went down with Berlin's internet. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. I know the versioning is is different for Darwin Core and the ABC EFG too. Yes. Sort of like numeric, right? Darwin Core uses dates. We were talking about back compatibility and things like that. So. I know when we started, it was not that trivial for, for these reasons. So we could find fields to map and so on. That was okay. But then when the 
version incomes and GBIF ask for back compatibility and so on. That's where the difficulty started. Well, and, and it, one of the reasons Darwin Core has terms and labels, you can yeah. always change a label, but once you've mapped a term, you know, they'll say like, it's very easy to add a term to Darwin Core. It's very hard to take one away, <laughs> right? And you can always change a label. That's not, it won't break anything, right? Because you you always map the terms because that's the machine part of it. And yeah. so more sustainable. Nobody has any more questions. I'm going to end the recording. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you for putting your effort in. I sent I sent my family skiing so I could work. <laughs> it's a it's a very quiet house at the moment. It's really nice. Well, thanks for coming, everybody.